you would please turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 3, just looking at a single verse there. I'll actually read a few verses, but <clears throat> primarily looking at one, one verse as we start this sermon series through October and no, November on our connection, our succession even from the Reformational Church. And as has been mentioned numerous times, especially over the last few months, that this is the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation that most historians connect with the event of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the church, to the castle church door in Wittenberg. Now, reform was happening prior to that, but... um, but certainly we connect that event with our history. What we are going to do over the coming weeks is we're going to look at what is termed the five solas. We're going to look beyond those five solas as well, but we're going to start with these five solas, or also referred to as the five alone statements. And I know people often are... are um, Enjoy the way I say own. own. Well, you're going to hear it a lot as I often will say alone. But uh, today we're going to start with the, who, and most people do begin with this, uh, this one, is sola scriptura, or scripture alone. And if you were to look at your Westminster Confession of Faith, if you, if you had one, which is, makes, up the, makes up a part of the constitution of our church, you'll see that chapter 1 of the Confession begins with the Holy Scriptures, even before uh, you see um, the doctrine of God. And that is in reference to sola scriptura, that it's the Scriptures that tell us about God. And now today what we are going to focus on in regard to sola scriptura is that the Scriptures have come from God, they are about God, and they're even, even for God. And because of that, God has chosen, as we'll see very clearly in 2 Timothy 3.16, God has chosen not just to give permission to have a biography done, but he's actually written an autobiography. And this is a very important thing as we are going to see. And so that's really our main, main idea that when we think of sola scriptura, and we're going to get into what, what all this says, when we think of sola scriptura, we are saying that God has chosen to write an autobiography, and this autobiography is given to us in the canon of the Holy Scriptures. So please follow along with me. On your screen, you're probably just going to see 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm actually going to start um, one... Uh, verse before that, in verse 15, where Paul is addressing Timothy and saying, From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. So here's going to be three points that are going to help us understand and break down this main main statement of God writing an autobiography. And the first thing we're going to look at is the purity of the Scriptures. The purity of the Scriptures. Now, in verse 16, Paul uses a word here that's not used anywhere else throughout the Bible. And he uses the word theonoustos in describing this breath, this breath of God. And what this is telling us is that the Bible that we have, of course, Paul is, is referring to what they had it in that day as the Old Testament. But what we start to see specifically from the Apostle Paul is the way that the New Testament is in the same God-given 
level as the Old Testament. And so we can, we can actually, because of the inspiration of the Spirit to the New Testament authors, we're actually able to take the New Testament and give it the same, put it in the same category as the Old Testament. That it's been breathed out by God, that the Holy Spirit, God himself, third person of the Trinity, has inspired through human authors the Holy Scriptures, this autobiography of God. And so God in his grace and in his wisdom and in his love for us has given us what we need in his word. And to give you a picture of God giving his word, we can go all the way back to the very beginning as we look at this other section of God's word that's been breathed out in the book of Genesis that speaks of God's word being breathed out. When we read about how God gave what was needed when he spoke and then there was light. Or when he spoke, giving his word, and then there was water. Or when he spoke and his word, was, his word went out and there were plants. We also read in Genesis 1 that it was his word or his speaking that created the animals and even humankind. He gave exactly what was needed in Genesis 1. And that's what he's done with his scriptures for us. And it's come to us in purity and it's come to us with integrity. And so here's what it means for scripture to be God's breath. It means that the, what we have in the Bible is what God intended for us to have. It's what he planned for us to be able to know him by and to understand what he longs for us and what he has planned for us. And so Matthew, the author of his gospel, he didn't, he didn't take what he knew about Jesus and then try his best to then shape it and mold it and fit it best with his own personality or occupation or his own desires. He didn't say, well, I am or I, I was a tax collector. And so let me take what I know about Jesus and what he spoke and let me kind of move it in this direction so it can best fit within my framework. Many of you know that that Luke, who authored his own gospel in the book of Acts, was a, was a physician. Now, physicians probably in the first century didn't, make, didn't accumulate the kind of wealth that they, some of them do today. However, he probably had a certain amount of resources. Now, his natural tendency would just be like our natural tendency. And it would be to write in a way that scripture would not make being a, be, having wealth being a negative thing. But I want you to listen to his account of something in Luke chapter 18 of the rich young ruler. This is what Luke the physician says. He says, but when he, when he heard these things, the rich young ruler, about that Jesus was telling him, he was, for he was extremely, he became sad because he was extremely rich. Verse 24 says, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now, it's one thing for Luke the physician to put that in Scripture. But it's a whole different thing altogether to not qualify it. Because what do we do? What do I do when I preach on that? I make sure that those of you who are wealthy can still be sure that there is a way for you to get into heaven. But Luke didn't do that. Luke didn't qualify it. Our natural response is to say, yes, wealth can be bad. But let me tell you how it can also be a good thing. Now that was Luke, that was probably Luke's natural tendency. His flesh probably would have wanted to place that disclaimer in Scripture. But isn't it interesting that the Spirit of God obviously didn't want that disclaimer in that particular scripture? 
And so there's a purity of God's word that we see in that writing. God's spirit knew and had to work against the flesh of Luke, knew that there was a greater need to warn against the dangers than to give freedom of accumulating wealth. And so Luke probably had to look at his own life. And as the Spirit was inspiring him to give this account of the rich young ruler, it probably called Luke to repentance. As he was calling us to repentance. Notice too that Paul had a background of strictly keeping the law. Not just prior to his conversion, even after his conversion, we learn about vows that the Apostle Paul would take. And yet, Paul over and over again talked about how the righteous will live by, not the law, but the righteous shall live by faith, which will be a basis for one of our other sermons, sola fide, faith alone. So what we see is, we see that the purity of God's breath overcame biases that would have been in place, politics, profession, different things that would have governed writers in one direction or another. God was sure that his word was going to remain pure. And so what we have here in front of us is not different interpretation. Though we have different books, we have different authors who live different lives, and we see that stuff come out. We see different writing styles in the Bible. We see context shine through the pages of Scripture, and there's different contexts for different books. But we don't see different interpretations of God's revelation. And as God chose these different people... A purity remained throughout his scriptures, and it has remained to this day. Now, whenever Elaine and I get together with either new friends or people that are new to the church, we might meet them somewhere, meet them here, or have, have people over to our home for dinner. And if it's a couple, then Elena, without fail, always asks this same question, tell us how you met. And she wants to know the story. And some of you in here have been a recipient of her questioning, wanting to know history of how people met. And usually, and, and really, I, as I think about it, I think it's actually every time that this question has been asked by my wife, and then one of the couples begins to then respond and tell the story never fails. The other couple steps in and says, actually, this is what happened in this particular point. In other words, as the story begins to be told, the other party recognizes there needs to be a correction. There needs to be at least some clarity here. I am not going to let you botch our story. Now, the human authors of Scripture, they were sinners, just like you and me. And they confessed it, even in their letters. And though God used them, and though God used their backgrounds, and though God used the way that he uniquely created them to bring his word to the world, he never allowed their prejudices to get in the way of what he was doing with his word. In other words, as mentioned earlier, God didn't just sign over his rights to allow for a biography. He wasn't going to let humans botch up his story. He determined that he was going to write an autobiography. And the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. And that's what we stand on when we say Scripture alone. That the Holy Spirit is perfectly wise. He cannot lie. He knows exactly what we need to hear and he knows exactly how we need to hear it. And this is why 
Scripture alone is the standard for our faith. And this is why Scripture alone is the standard for our worship. This is why Scripture alone is even the standard for our life. Because it alone maintains the perfect purity of God's voice. Only the Bible. Only the Bible maintains that perfect purity of God's voice. Not councils, not presbytery meetings, not session meetings, not deacon meetings. Only the Bible maintains the purity of God's perfect voice. So with that in mind, I want us to see this, this second point, the cross-cultural relevance of the Scriptures. Now, one of the great missions of the Reformers, and this, of course, as mentioned earlier, this began prior to Martin Luther doing his thing, but it, the mission of the Reformers, and this, is, this lasted even for centuries afterwards, it was simply to get the Holy Scriptures in the common vernacular into the hands of the common people. Because as the, as the medieval church uh, over time was gaining more and more in power, they were dictating God's will and dictating God's expectations to the common people. While the common people had no idea what the Bible actually said, even those that spoke and could read Latin, they were really forbidden by the clergy, clergy to the parishioners, forbade the people to interpret the scriptures, determining their own interpretations of what God is telling his people. But here's what most of the reformers understood. That one religious culture and one religious tradition is not able to determine truth for another culture and tradition with man-determined decrees. This is what the reformers are seeing. That a culture and a tradition from one era of time or one location on the map is not able to determine a culture or a tradition for another time or another location on the map. Only Scripture has the ability and the power and the authority to cross cultures and to maintain, maintain truth and revel, relevance about God and about God's desires for His people. And so a key point here, the Bible was breathed out to people in a time period that we do not live in, is what Paul's writing about. It was breathed out in a time, in a location that we do not live in, in a language that we do not speak. And so we must recognize that and handle it accordingly, appropriately, understand that we don't have the original manuscripts and languages of the Bible right here in front of us. But also that we have to see that God is eternal. So this was an eternal voice coming. The Holy Spirit is eternal, and, and the Holy Spirit even stated that His Word is eternal. And therefore, it's meant for us just as it was meant for them. Different land, different time, different language, meant for us in the same way. And this means that there is nothing that we have in front of us. There's nothing that I can turn to in here, though we could do that and you could question that greatly. But there's nothing in, this, in these books of scriptures that are irrelevant. It's still completely profitable for righteousness and equipping. And I hope you love that. And I hope you love that when God was breathing this out to different apostles, different authors, and as it was going from his breath into, into hearts and into ancient scrolls, that he had you in mind, that he was determining what you needed to hear, how you needed to hear it, in the first century and prior to the prophets. I hope that you're encouraged that when you can read the Psalms and you can say, boy, this sure does seem as if it's written for me. 
I hope that you can see that in fact it was. That God in fact was picturing your circumstances in these moments and writing the Psalms. His hope was that his son would be revealed in these very words to you as you need him. Now, ancient texts written by mere humans can have beauty and they can have value for today. Also, it's important to see natural law. It transcends time and cultures. But have you noticed, this is so important, have you noticed that ancient religions tend to keep their power centers in the same location throughout the centuries? Their customs primarily remain untouched. And though the Western world does everything that it can to combat that, ancient religions are primarily still ancient. They refuse to cross cultures as much as they may try. However, Christianity, who has a living Christ as its head, who has now ascended outside above time, refuses to get stuck on any one continent. He refuses to be bound within any one culture or any single tradition. The first century customs did not have the power to contain Jesus. You see how other ancient religions, their customs rule them? Christianity is very different. And it's because we have the breathed out word of Christ that's able to outlast an empire. It's able to outlast any tradition or way of life. It's why we have to base scripture alone on who this Jesus is and on what he has accomplished and what he is calling us to do because the grass withers, the flowers fall, empires fall, nations crumble. But what the Holy Spirit has told us is that the word of God remains forever. And that's why scripture alone is so important. I want us to see this third thing, and I'm going to wrap up here. The binding power of the scriptures. I'm going to read 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, where the apostle Peter said, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So he's affirming all that we've just talked through. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God elected a people to write his word. The Holy Spirit moved them to do that. And the truth is a mere person has no ability or authority to rule us or bind us or to tell us what is truly right and wrong. There's no mere human who has that authority. They try and have succeeded at times in accomplishing their goals. But ultimately, we are free to only be bound by Scripture. And I hope you grasp that phrasing. We're free to be bound by Scripture. The binding of Scripture is freedom. And that's what Peter is telling us in his epistle. Holy men, not by their own interpretation, not by their own will, but as the Holy Spirit moved. It's the Spirit who is causing them to write to speak, and I believe that that type of binding, that type of authoritative revelation began and ended with the scriptures. doesn't mean that God's silent, but it means that type of binding power, authoritative work began and ended with the holy scriptures. And remember, when the Protestant reformers started making their stand, the Roman church was essentially saying that the Bible is authoritative, but only as far as the church lets it be. 
or if the church decides one thing and the Bible says another, it's the church that brings the clarity. And it's the church that determines what the Bible is saying. So who is the interpreter of the Bible? It's the church. Well, the Reformers came along and said, no, only God interprets God. And so where there's lack of clarity in one area of the Scripture, we look to other areas of the Scripture to bring clarity and to bring the understanding of that binding truth. Because we will make mistakes. We will misunderstand things. We will give in to our flesh. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have those same weaknesses as he gives us the truth about God. So I want to mention this last little thing. When I was in college, a very new Christian, and I had a lot of things coming up, <clears throat> new things coming up in my life, and I go to my pastor, the one who led me to the Lord, and I said, hey, you know, I'm kind of at this place where I just really want to know the will of God for my life. And I said, can you kind of give me some insight on how to tap into that whole thing? Because I, I don't want to make mistakes going forward. And his response was very simple. To me, it was too simple then. But now I don't think it's too simple. But he just asked, he said, hey, are you in a Bible study? And I said, well, you know, I come here on Sundays. And he said, you need to be in a Bible study. Because as you're studying the scriptures, you're connecting yourself to God's will. And so that's what it means that the, there's a binding power in the scriptures. That it, the scriptures alone can have that kind of binding power. It binds us to God's desires. It's the Bible that binds us to God's will. Now, it doesn't mean that he's going to lay out detailed instructions for you at every moment. There's some things that the scriptures aren't going to exhaustively say. But the scriptures are going to bind us to God's heart. And it, the scriptures bind us to the gospel. So it's not too simple. And so while I can believe that knowing the Bible can give us clear and even bind us to right doctrine, and I think we do that well in our church and our, our denomination, we have good doctrinal statements, good values. But ultimately, when we envelop ourselves in God's word, and when the study of it becomes a real discipline and a real rhythm in our life, we get connected to his heart. He begins to share his self with us. There's a new, type of, a new type of embrace that comes. We become more sure of what our life is, what's happening in our life, even when it's falling apart, because we know we're in the hands of God. We know that he is connecting his heart to ours. And that's why we say scripture alone, because it's only scripture, only the Bible, God's breathed out word that can do that for us as he reveals the Holy Christ to us. Let's pray.